Welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we'll be discussing the early councils of the Church and how doctrine developed in those early times. Officially, there have been 21 ecumenical councils in Church history, but I think the first 10 will be enough for this season. Today, we'll be discussing the sixth official ecumenical council, the Third Council of Constantinople. Ecumenical councils have always been uncommon occurrences, and in this case over a century had passed between the Second Council of Constantinople and the Third. This council was mainly motivated by the emperor, Constantine IV, also known as Constantine Pogonatus, who wanted to settle all the religious disputes in the land. He sent a letter to Pope Donus in 678 AD, but sadly the Pope was dead before he got the letter. The letter was received instead by his successor, Pope St. Agato, who worked together with a number of other bishops over the next couple of years to compile a comprehensive assessment of the issues that the emperor had proposed dealing with at the council, specifically the heresy of monothelitism, the position that Jesus had only one will, not two, a human will and a divine will. Their assessment addressed the main errors of monothelitism and condemned it as a heresy. They also wrote up a profession of faith condemning this heresy and a letter on dogma from the Pope, and sent them, along with three papal legates, to the emperor. The emperor ordered a council of bishops to begin a short time after that, which would last for 18 sessions. In the second session, the letter from the Pope and a document containing judgments from a synod of the Western Church, a council of sorts, but not as widespread as a general or ecumenical council, were read on the subject of monothelitism. The judgment made by both was that Jesus had two wills, a human and a divine will, and therefore monothelitism was false. The evidence was convincing to the patriarch of Constantinople, a man named George, who quickly accepted the judgment. Unfortunately, not everyone was so agreeable. Though the council continued for some time, most of it devoted to examining the texts that reference or imply evidence of the wills of Jesus, the patriarch of Antioch, Macarius by name, absolutely refused to go along with the judgments of the council, so he was removed from his position. However, before leaving, he drew attention to a letter from a previous pope, Honorius I, which had been sent to Patriarch Sergius of Constantinople almost fifty years earlier. In that letter, on the topic of the wills of Jesus, he agrees with the position of Sergius that it would be well to avoid two operations. Because of this, the late Pope Honorius was judged a heretic by the Third Council of Constantinople. Some people think the case of Honorius disproves the Catholic doctrine of papal infallibility, but in fact, it doesn't. You see, papal infallibility only comes into effect under very precise circumstances, when the Pope is speaking as pastor and doctor of Christians, through his authority, defining some doctrine about faith or morals, which must be held by the universal church. Honorius had his own views on various subjects, but he never tried to define doctrine based on them. So there isn't really any problem with saying papal infallibility is a real thing, and also that a former pope was guilty of saying something heretical. Overall, the council passed the judgments it set out to pass, and life went on. Next, the Second Council of Nicaea. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.